You know, we've looked at a lot over the last couple of weeks. We've seen how fear can be harnessed for good and for bad. We've seen how God is in control and how we have a future promise. We've seen that God still heals. Healing is possible. And we've seen how all this impacts others throughout the entire series. You know, God is always at work reconciling and redeeming the world. On Sunday, we looked at how our faith can impact others' lives and others' faith can impact our lives. And this is remarkable and something we've seen throughout this whole series, that our faith can remove the obstacles for others and God is looking to remove the obstacles between us and Him. You know, it's easier to believe God to remove the obstacles when it's for a friend. But what about when it's someone you don't know? Or worse still, when it's someone you don't like? Can you work with God in faith to remove the obstacles for your enemies? The story of Jonah is an interesting one. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you might remember hearing a story about a guy being swallowed by a big fish. But the fish isn't the point of the story. The story begins when God sends a prophet named Jonah to Nineveh, which is a brutal city-state with a brutal army full of brutal warriors. And Jonah runs away. Jonah goes the opposite direction because Nineveh is an enemy to Israel, an enemy to him, and is known for brutality. I can't think of a harder group of people to go to in God's name. I wouldn't want to go because of fear. But Jonah doesn't run away from Nineveh because of fear. Oh, no, no. He runs away in the opposite direction for another reason. He tells us later on in the book when he says, Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish, since I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he wanted disaster to come to Nineveh. That is a deep level of hurt and fear, and it's very human. Now, this is what I call a softball question. It's an icebreaker. So talk amongst yourselves and see what countries today might feel the same way towards each other as Jonah felt towards Nineveh. Talk about which countries and if necessary, why. It's a tough question, right? It's a tough thing to face. It puts you in an interesting headspace to think about how an Israeli going to the Palestinians with a message that causes them to turn to God, or, or to think about a Ukrainian leaving their bombed out home to go and preach Jesus to Russia and Russians. Never mind the hundreds of other high stake fights around the world. I think of the Uyghurs in China, or we can go back a few years with the Tutsi and Hutu in Rwanda. The stakes start to get pretty high. The story of Jonah starts to become a lot less theoretical. It becomes less of a story about a big fish. It becomes a story about how God asked Jonah to do a very hard thing. Imagine going to an invading enemy with the message of God that will lead to salvation. On a more personal level, maybe imagine going out of your way to be kind to Bob in accounting because of your faith in Jesus, or praying for Karen in HR. It's funny, right? Most of the people who we struggle with day in and day out, the ones we struggle with the most are not trying to invade and kill and destroy us. But it takes faith in Jesus to be kind to them. Even though the stakes aren't as high as Jonah, this helps us to understand Jonah a little better. We start to identify with Jonah a little more. Yet Jonah was so opposed to the plan that he went the opposite direction. He actively worked towards putting in place an obstacle to the forgiveness of Nineveh. He was trying to block Nineveh from experiencing God in a positive way. In the story of the, the lame man who was healed, we can see how the faith of some friends removes obstacles. The story and the challenge gets harder when it's people we don't like or people we know. 
After Jonah is thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish, and spit up on the shore, after God sends Jonah again to make the trip to Nineveh, he arrives and says what God told him to say. You know, the city-state listens, it goes into mourning, and God has mercy on the city-state of Nineveh, of Nineveh. It's interesting. God didn't have to stop Jonah from running away. God could have used someone else. Why did God use Jonah the second time? I think God used Jonah because God was doing something in Jonah as well as doing something through Jonah. So here's what I mean. Who told the story? Right? Think about it. Jonah talking with God. There's no record that anyone else is around. And Jonah's behavior gets worse throughout the whole story. He sits and sulks when the entire city listens to God, but no one is sulking with him. He's on his own. The book ends with God asking Jonah a question. And Jonah looks really bad. But again, no one else was there. The only person who could have told the story of Jonah is Jonah. There was no one else. This book that challenges and inspires has an anti-hero at the center of it. And we know this story because through this experience, Jonah is transformed. It doesn't say it in the book of Jonah that Jonah was transformed. But the existence of the book of Jonah is how we know that he was. Jonah is the only one who could tell the story. And Jonah is so transformed through God's actions that he tells the story in a way that God looks as good as God is. And Jonah does not make himself look very good at all in the retelling. Tell you what, I might be talking a little bit too much about a story that not everybody knows. So we're going to do a recap. Have someone in your group do a quick recap of the story of Jonah for the benefit of the group. Okay, now think about Jonah. He doesn't look very good through the story, does he? Who's the hero of the book of Jonah? It's God. Jonah's sort of a villain or an anti-hero. Jonah's a guy who had faith in God and ran away because of that faith. Okay, so having done the recap, here's the discussion question. If you were Jonah, how would you tell the story? What would you leave in and what would you take out? The actions of God through Jonah ultimately removed obstacles so that Nineveh could be saved instead of destroyed. Jonah, through much coercion, eventually played a part in God's work of redemption for his enemies. It may be easier to believe that God wants you to believe and act in faith for family and friends. It may be easier to believe that God wants you to remove obstacles for the ones you love. But what if... God wants to transform you through extending love to the ones you find it difficult to love, to Bob in accounting and Karen in HR. What if God wants to use you to remove the obstacles for your enemies specifically because they are your enemies? What does that even look like? How do you remove obstacles for enemies? Or at least difficult people. And I mean, we should probably talk about what an obstacle is. I mean, think about the lame man, the lame man on the mat uh, from, from the story of the guy that Jesus healed. He had two obstacles. He couldn't walk to go into the temple or the synagogue, and if he did, he wasn't really allowed in. So friends picked him up and brought him to Jesus directly into the presence of God. I'd say they cleared the obstacles pretty well, but they were friends, and he left them. But what are the obstacles for enemies or frenemies or people who irritate you to no end? In fact, sometimes it's hard to even think of what the obstacles might be for these people simply because we avoid them. You could even say like a certain Old Testament prophet, we run in the opposite direction. In Jonah's case, God gave him a message to speak out loud. And certainly, wisdom is an important component of how we deal with enemies, friends, frenemies, and irritants. See, wisdom will tell us to forgive and then examine whether we should renew or or release the relationship. So it's important to hold these decisions in the background. Pray and ask for wisdom. 
However, sometimes, like Jonah, we will also have the ability to help remove obstacles that stand in the way of people that we don't have great relationships with. And this is a much trickier part of following God's leading. But anyway, think about that. Think about it, about how meaningful it is when someone you like does something kind for you. But think about how bewildering it is when someone you have a bad relationship with does something kind. They're two different kinds of meaningful. And, but also, there's something that I hate about when someone you have a bad relationship with does something kind. When it happens once, it gets treated with suspicion and maybe even rejected. It's in the multiples that kindness has its greatest impact. Think of it like this. If you put a shovel into the ground, you just make a small hole. But if you drag a shovel with a tractor for a long time, but then you've started to plow a field so things can grow. One act planted with the help of the Holy Spirit can make a huge difference, but so can sustained actions over time. So we're going to get brainstorming. What are some ways that a person could remove obstacles for an enemy, for enemy irritant? This can include something unexpected, a one-time thing like helping them when their car breaks down. It can include sustained behavior over time, like buying a coffee or tea weekly or affirming something good that you've seen in them. But here we go. Brainstorm in your groups, what are some things that you might be able to do that can break down or remove some obstacles for those difficult people in your life? You know, there are lots of options. There are large things you can do. There are small things you can do. If you can't come up with any ideas, I recommend starting to pray for them. And like we saw last week, you can absolutely pray like David did. You know, God, break their teeth so that they, only, they can only eat soft food. But I suspect that, that God might start to do some work on your heart if you do pray that way. I recommend praying that God will bless them, asking God for wisdom and how to work or live with them, or even asking God how you might be able to play a part in what he wants from them. I like the idea of praying for them because God's imagination is so much bigger than mine. I know it's a little, little crazy, but how big is God's imagination? I mean, it's, it's pretty big. Think about it. God invented penguins, a bird that swims and doesn't fly. And that completely messes with my idea of what a bird is. He also made fish that jump out of the water and glide through the air. Messes with my idea of what a fish is. I can't explain it, and I probably couldn't have dreamed it into existence, but God did, and he did so much more. So God's imagination is bigger than ours. A good place to start is by asking him for ideas. Now, one obstacle that I think is really important, the one that helps everything else, is to start with forgiveness. Now think about it. Think about how powerful forgiveness is when it comes from someone who has been hurt. Uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, the Archbishop of Cape Town, when he was talking about forgiveness and victims and violence, he said, but we were always bowled over by the magnanimity of victims, both black and white, who were able to forgive some of the most dastardly atrocities. Had they not, South Africa would have been overwhelmed by a horrendous racial bloodbath. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, an Anglican Archbishop who talked about forgiveness all the time was bowled over by the victims who were forgiving. It was that impactful. And think about this. He's attributing the absence of conflict or the inverse, which is the presence of peace, to the forgiveness of the victims. The word peace is a loaded word in the Bible because it means so much more than the absence of conflict. It means everything that is possible when there is no conflict. In biblical peace, you have good relationships. You have people who help you out when you're in need so you can, uh, so you can thrive. You have people who you help out when they're in need. You have community in the best sense of the word. You work together, not against each other, but also not ignoring each other. Good meals around a table with neighbors is a possibility because of peace and in South Africa and in Rwanda. Some of these tables had the perpetrator and the victim sharing together at the same table. Archbishop Tutu would oversee the Truth and Reconciliation Project in Rwanda, and out of it have come some powerful pictures of what forgiveness accomplishes in both the victim and the perpetrator's lives. 
Now, forgiveness takes only one party, but reconciliation does take two. In fact, that statement earlier uh, comes from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Having gone through a process of forgiveness, you come to a point where you need to examine whether it's time to renew or release the relationship. This reminds me of Jesus' instructions to be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. There are times when, when relationships need to be let go. You need to forgive them, but also to let them go. Now imagine what that looks like to your coworkers, even if you release the relationship. Because you've forgiven them, you don't try and take them out at the knees every chance you get. You sow into peace by not sniping from a distance. And this is powerful in you because you're freed through forgiveness, but also pow powerful for the people around you. Because honestly, forgiveness doesn't make sense. In the case of coworkers, release, uh, releasing a relationship can sometimes even be extended to looking for a different job. Anyway, but after forgiving, how is a person supposed to know what the wise course of action is? Uh, in James, there's a verse that says, if any of us lacks wisdom, we should ask God without wavering. And then he gives generously and without judging or rebuking, finding fault. This is a pretty profound promise. The prayer and the challenge is that God will give us courage and wisdom to know what is the wise course of action. Should we release or should we renew the relationship? If we release the relationship, what does that look like? And if we renew, what does that look like? This comes from wisdom and God gives wisdom. So once God gives us wisdom, we can begin to act accordingly. We can begin to remove obstacles for others, friends, neighbors, enemies, whoever God may be calling us towards. I love the story of Jonah because he is so real. He is so very human. He does the things that I want to do. I want to run away from loving enemies. I want to sulk when they come to Jesus. And when I follow Jesus into forgiving people and exploring what the wise thing is to do, I get transformed enough by God in the process to tell the story as it is, as opposed to how I want to tell the story. Enemies, friends, family. Our faith can remove obstacles for others to be able to encounter the presence of God so they can experience reconciliation with God. But fear, when it sets itself up against being able to trust God, is a liar. God is good, his character is good, his power is limitless, his promise is sure. He breaks into our situations and transforms lives. Fear will tell you that forgiveness lets the other person off scot-free. Fear will tell you that vengeance is more important than justice or forgiveness. Fear will tell you that you need to be more powerful than the other person, or at least seen as more powerful. Fear will tell you that God isn't powerful enough to protect you or to heal you. Fear will tell you that God isn't just. Fear will say when God asks us to forgive and to love our enemies, it will tell us that God isn't good and that he doesn't have our maturity and our growth and our good in mind. Fear will tell us that God is punishing you unfairly by asking you to do these things, but fear is a liar. Scripture and experience have confirmed that God is good, and we have tasted and seen that God is good. God being good doesn't keep God from asking us to do difficult things. In fact, sometimes it requires it. Because God, who is good, will ask us to do difficult things for our good, for the good of the world around us, for the good of our community. This is a hard but good and beautiful thing. Discussion question number four. Is there someone God is calling you towards that you would rather run from? How can wisdom and courage work together? By the way, I'd also like you to pray for each other's people and situations. Over the course of this series, we've looked at fear and faith, at how God is in control, at how God has given us a future promise despite present troubles. We've looked at healing and at faith to remove obstacles from the presence of God. Here's discussion question number five. What has stood out to you over the course of this small group? 
What's been a highlight or a favorite part for you? 